Welcome, Dr. Barbara Allen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to try to dispel with the microphone, if that's okay. I usually project pretty well. As a matter of fact, my family tells me I project too well most days. Um, are, are you able to hear me in, in the back? Okay, then, then we'll do that so it doesn't squeak and squawk. And, and Johnny has uh, kindly offered to, to change the slides for me, so because I can't stay tied to a, uh, a podium well. I, I respect <laughs> you when, when you are uh, giving your, your, your sermons that you're able to stand in one place in many cases, but I, I pace like crazy, so forgive me for doing that. It's truly my honor to be here and, and speak with you today because uh, you have given your lives to service. Um, and my goal is to do what I can to help <laughs> give you some guidance on some things that you can do to extend that life in service. Um, just like when we're uh, flying in an airplane and the flight attendant comes down the aisle and says, in the unlikely event of a rapid decompression, put on your oxygen mask before putting on others. And I look around when they're giving that, that lecture and or the safety briefing, and I see many, many young mothers and many couples traveling together that say, I would never do that. No, you know, I, you know, I would help them first because that would be the unselfish thing to do. Yet having worked in aerospace physiology where I trained pilots on recognizing their symptoms of hypoxia, what happens when you're unable to use oxygen, I learned very quickly that if you're able to put your mask on first, you're able to help hundreds of others. And that's what I'm going to try to convince you to do today is, you know, I, I know you went through some screening earlier today and you may have heard about some elevated cholesterol levels or higher blood pressure levels or um, if you have diagnoses of heart disease or hypertension or diabetes, um, we want to see what we can do to help control those risk factors so that you can stay healthier and help as many as you possibly can. So that's, that's truly our goal today. Um, I had a different talk, and, and Johnny helped me with it a little bit because it had a lot of uh, information. It had a lot of pictures of... Uh, <laughs> It was kind of more geared towards women. So this one's a little bit more geared towards uh, uh, men. I tried to put in some things more, maybe more geared to the Y chromosomes a little bit. So it's really kind of uh, Indianapolis, IndyCar themed. Um, and you'll, you'll see that going all the way through. So for those of you that, that don't like themes like that, I apologize. But, but I think you'll get the gist, gist of it. My, my goal today is to talk about what we can do to um, maintain a level of readiness and drivability for the human machine um, from your pit crew. In, in medicine, we are all here to help you and help guide you through uh, you know, the different processes and the different disease processes. But that requires routine maintenance. It requires using the right fuel. <laughs> you don't want to put sugar in your gas tank. Uh, you have to make sure you're using the high octane fuels you have to look under the hood once in a while, and what I mean by that is know your risk factors um, and take full stock of them. When you look in the mirror and you say, doggone it, I put on a couple extra pounds <laughs> uh, over the holidays going to all of those different events, um, then we need to work it to take them off. Get on the gauges, and what I mean by that is know your numbers. Um, part of that is knowing what your cholesterol level is. For those of you with diabetes, knowing what that glycohemoglobin is. Um, knowing what your blood pressure is, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, rotate the tires. You, you don't want to have a wobble <laughs> when you drive. And that's one of the ways to help prevent that is to uh, maintain exercise levels. <laughs> I told Johnny, sorry. Um, but then I want you to drive, and I want you to live life to its fullest. Uh, next slide, please. So um, any driver knows that to get optimum performance, we have to have good maintenance, and that is routine maintenance. Indy cars, when they pull into the pit stop, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're changing tires, they're gassing up the tank, they're checking all the gauges, and one of the most important ways you can do that is to actually go see the doctor <laughs> and tell them how you're feeling and take stock of those very important uh, clinical feedback mechanisms that we have, which is blood pressure, height, weight, glucose, cholesterol levels, some of the things that you've already had, had checked today. Next slide, please. So we can wait for it to happen. We can wait for some of the inevitable health risk issues to happen, uh, or we can control the things we can. Next slide, please. Mario Andretti, keeping with the car theme, uh, says that if you wait, all that happens is you get older. <laughs> um, so it is going to happen. We're all aging, and we will all 
have uh, different disease processes that, that we will uh, struggle with and uh, on occasion suffer with. But there are some that are absolutely preventable or controllable. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about as well. Next slide. So routine maintenance. Go to the doctor. It's like telling people, go to mass. Go to church. Don't be a creaster. <laughs> We go to the doctor. Um, and men tend not to go to the doctor as much as women. Why? Well, women start going to the doctor once a year early on, starting at age 18 to 20, or with the birth of their first children, and they get used to that routine follow-up and maintenance. They build up a relationship with their doctors, and they just get used to going back. Hey, doc, let me just tell you, is this anything to worry about? Men tend not to do that as much unless they come in, cut, bleeding, broken elbows, you know, their shoulders out of socket, <laughs> something pretty bad going on when they're younger. And th they tend not to build those relationships quite as much. I would encourage you uh, to please make sure you have established a primary care physician that you see at least once a year, even if you feel great. And even if you're car is optimally performing, you still need routine maintenance. So even if you feel great, please let them check your blood pressure, check your cholesterol, check your glucose levels. Make sure that indeed even though you feel good, everything is operating well. <laughs> um, because some of those early warning signs we can catch early and prevent problems down the road. Um, know your family, no, not yet, <laughs> sorry, I pointed, didn't mean to. Know your family history. This is very important for those genetic diseases uh, like uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, cardiovascular disease, colon cancer. Uh, they say prostate cancer isn't necessarily a genetic disease, but we do see it trend through families, so that is incredibly important to check. Uh, your prostate health is very important to check. Um, so you should be having routine PSA levels drawn uh, as well. Um, talk to your health care provider. Tell them how you're feeling. Tell them what some of your concerns are. Please know what some of those family risk factors are. And know your medications. Um, and just, you know, um, just like when people come to you and say, I've, I've got this issue I need to talk to you about, and they kind of dance all around it but don't really tell you what the real issue is, in, in our office as well, that happens a lot. And people say, oh, you know, I, I don't know. It's no big deal, doc. I just, I have blood in my urine every time I, I urinate. No, it's no, no big deal. Or, you know, I've been on these five different medications, and, and I've been out of them for a while. Um, I don't remember what they're for. Uh, I don't know what the name is. One's white, one's pink, one's blue. One's kind of an off-color, oval, uh, oval color. Please know your medications because medications in combination um, can ca cause significant risk factors. And one of the most important things you can do is keep a list of what medications you're on in your pocket, in your wallet. Make sure um, you know, folks around you know what they are in the event of an emergency or know what your allergies to medications are. Um, and so I'm asking you to take charge of your health. Take control of it. Next slide, please. So, I'm going to ask you to look under the hood. Um, and so this is what I call the Stockdale principle. When uh, Admiral Stockdale was in uh, the Hanoi Hilton um, as a prisoner of war, um, he was there, if I'm not mistaken, for seven years. And he, um, in spite of being interrogated many times over for many, many years, he actually um, came through that process very, very stoic, um, but he was able to to wake every day and say, I can make it through, I can make it through, I can make it through. And his fellow prisoners, in some of the writings that they've um, come through uh, lately, uh, that we've seen in some of the books, have said, how, how did, what was different? Why was his mental status, why was his outlook and his attitude so much better than some of the folks that, that, that broke or, or had, had significant mental, mental problems afterward? And they call it the Stockdale Principle. And the Stockdale principle is that he took clear stock of what was going on in front of him. And he said, I know I may not get out of this. And I know that every single day I'm going to be tortured. And every single day this is going to happen. And the likelihood of us truly being rescued is very low. Given that, this is my plan. And so what I find is many people in medicine do not... <laughs> 
<laughs> do not subscribe to what I call the Stockdale principle. And that is taking a firm, hard look in the mirror and saying, doggone it, I'm not getting younger. My blood pressure's elevated. My blood sugars are elevated. I have a strong family history of colon cancer. I need to have that colonoscopy. Don't want it, need to have it. I need to make sure I'm seeing a cardiologist or controlling my blood pressure. So please look under the hood. Know your risk factors. Um, so does your engine look pristine like this? <laughs> or is it looking a little bit more like this? And so that, in my mind, equates to coronary artery disease. Um, some of the narrowing of cardiovascular or some of the blood vessels going back from the heart back to itself to give blood supply. If you have high blood pressure, uh, atherosclerosis, that placking in the coronary arteries, then your engine's going to be performing a little bit more like this. So let's see what we can do to, to clear that up. So there are some risk factors that you can't change. Of course, increasing age, we can't change that. That's a wonderful thing because with age comes experience. Um, heredity, there are genetic uh, factors that we inherit that we, we deal with. Um, our race, there are some um, Hispanics, um, African Americans are at a higher risk for diabetes. Their kidney functions are affected a little bit differently just because of some of the genetic factors there. So we need to watch certain populations very, very closely. Um, in certain Mediterranean populations, there are higher risk factors of hemophilia and some of those uh, conditions that we need to watch closely. And of course, different diseases run through many different families. If you've had a previous history of a heart attack or stroke, if it's already happened, you can't go back and change that. But hopefully we can prevent the next one. And of course, uh, you can't change your gender. Well, actually we can change gender now. You can't change your genetic makeup. <laughs> um, so we're not gonna be able to change those, those factors. Um, so what are the risk factors that we can change? Absolutely, we can, we can control high blood pressure. For some people, high blood pressure is very difficult to control. Um, the average number of medications that someone is going to need to be on to get optimal control of their blood pressure over uh, their lifetime is four, meaning you may be on as many as four different medications at one time. And those are medications like the ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, the little bit of the water pill, and a calcium channel blocker. Some of you in here may be on one or all four of those types of medications to control blood pressure. High blood cholesterol. There are some families where high cholesterol runs in the family. You could eat tree bark and water and still have a total cholesterol of 300 and an LDL of, of 200. But we can control those now. The medications like Lipitor, like Simvastatin, like Zocor, those medications are absolutely amazing. And if you have elevated cholesterol and are able to take those medications, please talk to your doctor about being on those to control that narrowing of those coronary arteries that can increase your risk of heart disease and stroke. Tobacco smoking, we can absolutely control that. Cigarettes, um, you know, there used to be commercials in the 1960s and 1970s showing people sitting in the doctor's office while the doc's smoking. We really didn't know what it was doing uh, back then, but now we do know that all the, the side effects of cigarettes and tobacco, um, including cigars, um, on coronary arteries, on blood vessels, it affects the lining of the blood vessels, um, medically obese, and that increases our risk factors for many, many things, especially for diabetes. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Physical inactivity, we can control that. Even people that cannot exercise in the traditional ways by walking because of knee problems, because of paraplegia or stroke, can get exercise by sitting, by standing, by moving. Uh, I tell some of my patients, especially some of my elderly patients, that I'm afraid they're going to fall. If they go outside and walk on uneven pavement, I don't want them to fall and break a hip. That's, that's horrible for their health. So I ask them to stand up in the middle of a, their favorite one-hour TV show, and we usually spend five or ten minutes talking about their favorite TV shows, <laughs> but stand up next to their favorite chair or sofa with their hand firmly on the back of the sofa and walk in place during the commercial breaks, doing nothing more than this, using the largest muscles in the body, stabilizing themselves. They're not in un inclement weather. They're not on uneven terrain. Um, and it's no different than getting on a Stairmaster at a gym. And I guarantee it's burning calories. And I'm gonna get out of breath if I keep doing it, so I'll apologize. But if you do, if you take those three 
uh, uh, breaks during commercials during a one hour show, that's 18 minutes of exercise. That's the equivalent of walking one mile. That's fantastic. So that's the kind of, those are the kinds of things we can do. Diabetes. Um, diabetes, the rate of diagnosis of diabetes is climbing in, in or worldwide, but especially in America. Diabetes is a very, very scary disease. Because of the higher blood sugars, um, what happens is diabetes affects the smallest blood vessels, and it just affects the blood vessels that go to your eyes, the smallest blood vessels that go to kidney, that go to uh, the heart, and that go to your feet and, and to the nerves and affects the feet. So if we don't control our diabetes over time, we're at risk for blindness, for early heart attacks, for a loss of feet because of circulatory problems as well as infections, as well as you know, sores because of not being able to feel them. Um, and so anything we can do to control diabetes, to diagnose it early and to prevent it, we want to do. It's, it's a scary disease. Next slide, please. So other factors that affect your risks, of course, there are other modifying factors. Individual response to stress. We used to hear all about the type A personality. Well, now we don't talk about type A personalities anymore because that's not politically correct. But if, you're just, if we just think about it, if, there's, if the higher the level of stress, the higher the constant level of the fight or flight response in the human body. That fight or flight response in the human body drives up that adrenaline level. So if your adrenaline level is always right there saying run, run, but you know you can't. What's happening? Well, you're making more gastric acid. You're, because of the higher adrenaline level, your blood sugars are up so that your muscles have the ability to sprint when you need it. Um, and your heart's going a little bit faster. Your blood pressure's going up. And that increases. It, it, we're a hydraulic system, folks. Um, phenomenally designed, the hydraulic system. And increased blood pressure is no different than cranking up your garden hose. So if there's a weak spot in the, in the hose anywhere, what happens? That's where you get the shear forces. That's where the hose breaks. That's where you get blood clots bleeding into the blood vessels themselves. That increases the, heart, uh, the risk of heart, heart attacks and strokes. Um, drinking too much alcohol, of course, anything that affects the liver, affects blood pressure, affects clotting, uh, affects all of, all of the, the systems in the body. Uh, and illegal drugs, we know the effects of those. So. Get on the gauges. I understand you spent some time this morning having, having your blood checked, having your blood pressure checked, doing some screening. So what I would like you to do is have a bit of a walking knowledge of your current state of health, meaning what's your blood pressure and is it under control? What's your cholesterol level and is it under 200, which is what we want it to be? Is that LDL number, that low density lipoprotein, that's the stuff that clogs up the arteries, is that level under 100? Um, what's your fasting glucose level? Are you at increased risk for uh, diabetes? Or do you have diabetes and it's not well controlled? What is your body mass index? Um, and we'll talk about what the goals for that are. Waist circumference in men should be less than 41. Um, if it's not, you're at increased risk for something called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a series of different processes including High blood pressure, it increases the risk for stroke, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, elevated triglycerides, the whole kit and caboodle. And then this last one, it says uh, days per week of physical activity. Start with seven. <laughs> if you miss one, no big deal. Then you're, then you're at six. If you miss two, you're at five. But if you don't make exercise a routine, dedicated uh, dedicated part of your daily routine, um, then it's so easy to get out of the habit of doing that. And you'll notice that that says zero up there. So I'd, I'd like you to, to change that to seven, please. So these are the numbers that I just ran through very quickly. And I think you have that in your handout in very small print. <laughs> but we also have some handouts on the back table that talk about the goals of uh, the cholesterol. It's called... Uh, wellness or optimum wellness, uh, but it's a great, great handout. So that total cholesterol should be less than 200. Um, your LDL, that's the bad cholesterol, optimally less than 100. Your good cholesterol, that's, those are the, think about them as the Pac-Man or the rotor rooter that goes in and cleans out the pipes. That one we want to be high. That's the only cholesterol level that you want to be high. 
And I've got some athletes in my practice whose goal it is to have a higher HDL level than their LDL level. So their HDL is hitting 90 because they exercise like fiends. <laughs> Too much of anything we have to worry about. <laughs> they exercise like fiends and their uh, LDL level is down around uh, 70. So they've, they've met their goals. Blood pressure, ideally that should be less than 120 over 80, ideally. For some people, it's very difficult to get it less than 130 over 80, but ideally less than 120. Fasting glucose, we want that less than 100. If your fasting blood sugar is higher than 126, then that's diagnostic of diabetes. That's fasting, meaning nothing to eat for 8 to 12 hours. Um, we also use another number called the glycohemoglobin or the hemoglobin A1C to measure the three-month average of blood sugars. Um, and that number should be less than 6.5. And I'll be happy uh, after we talk to talk about any, any uh, numbers on any of those readouts if you have any questions on what you got this morning. Your body mass index, we want that ideally between 18 and 25. My body mass index is 26. I've been trying to lose the same 20 pounds for the last 20 years. So <laughs> I know it's not easy. Um, but we have to, to work to keep that down in, in that ideal area or the risk factors do climb. And we'll talk about what that is. Physical activity, minimum of 30 minutes, hopefully seven days a week. Next slide, please. So listen to the engine. You gotta know your warning signs. This was a uh, little gift. Uh, when I graduated from the Air Force Academy, I looked around and every, everybody had these sports cars. It was the classic fighter, pi fighter pilot syndrome, right? Well, I wasn't going into pilot training. My eyes weren't good enough. Um, and so, yeah, I, I didn't have a Corvette. I had the little clunker that I had in high school that got me to and from swim practice, and that was okay. But for um, three years ago, my husband surprised me with an 86 Corvette. And I can tell you that when the engine's running well, you know it. And when your engine's running well, you know it. But when something doesn't feel right, I want you to listen to it. It's no different than when your vehicle is not running well and you make a knocking sound or you hear a fan belt <laughs> you know, off or something's just not right. You take it to the mechanic and you describe what you heard to the mechanic. And I'd, I'd love to sit down with a mechanic sometime and just hear about some of those stories that they hear. Oh, yeah, this lady came in and said, rrr, 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 <laughs> describing all these sounds. But this is what I want you to do when it comes to your own body. I want you to listen to your engine. Your heart is the pump. It's the engine that drives that vital blood supply to your brain, to your heart, to your kidneys. Um, and if there's something not right about it, if, if your heart is not getting enough oxygen, so let's talk about how it gets oxygen. Pretty ingenious system that was designed here. Um, if the way the heart supplies itself from the main ventricle, the largest pump of the heart, there are small blood vessels from the largest artery, from the very first part of the largest artery that jump back to the heart itself to supply its own blood supply. Okay. So a heart attack occurs if that small blood vessel, and in most cases, that blood vessel is about the size of the tip of this silver pen that you have on your desk. It's not very large because we're talking about a small muscle, uh, but it's not very large. So you can imagine what it takes to get a blockage inside of something that size. Um, so if there's a blockage, a narrowing, or if that shear force, like we talked about with the garden hose, breaks, opens up, and bleeds inside of the blood vessel itself, or you get a clot, that's what causes a heart attack. So what are the heart attack warning signs? Chest pressure, chest pain, the classic signs. Um, now, there are a lot of different signs that we watch for, and I'll talk to you about a couple different ones that I, I've seen just recently in the office. But um, the classic sign, when you see one of, your, uh, one of your members clutching their chest, stopping what they're doing, talking about not being able to breathe, feeling like an elephant sitting on their chest, breaking out in a sweat, pale, heart attack will prove otherwise, folks. Um, I had a gentleman that had had a stent placed uh, about two months ago come into the office about, about three weeks ago, and all he said 
my shoulder is just really, really bothering me. And I said, so, and he's really trying to talk me out of the fact that this is really a big concern, but the fact that he's a male <laughs> and he's in the office saying that his shoulder is bothering him and he came in that day to be seen made me concerned. But it was the next thing he said, I woke up in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock in the morning with my shoulder hurting me. Now, unless you fall out of bed, <laughs> you dislocate your shoulder or something, it's pretty unusual to wake up in the middle of the night with, with that kind of an acute symptoms, a squeezing symptoms. So chest pain, substernal, to the arm. Sometimes it's to this arm. Shortness of breath. Can't take a deep breath. Can't breathe. Sometimes nausea, sometimes throwing up because there's a nerve that runs across the front of the heart that actually goes to the stomach. So if the heart's not getting enough blood supply, it gets inflamed, it stops moving like it's supposed to, and people will actually get nauseous because of that uh, nerve. So listen to those. Next slide, please. What if it's a stroke? What if this process involves a small blood vessel in the brain somewhere? That's when you see symptoms like one-sided facial drooping, people suddenly in unable to talk, just can't form the words. They're looking at you, they're scared to death, they can't form the words. Can't move their right arm, can't move their left arm, unable to uh, move one leg, unable to balance, extreme dizziness. We can see any number of symptoms. Uh, severe headache, of course. Next, next slide, please. So listen, listen to your symptoms. The next, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is using the right fuel. They actually cooked a really healthy meal for you today. I was pleased to see that, that it wasn't deep-fried lasagna or something. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we don't want to put uh, sugar in our, our gas tanks. We don't want all of everything that we eat to be McDonald's. If you haven't watched Super Size Me, it's, it's an education. Um, we have to use that high-octane fuel. And those high-octane fuels are the fresh fruits, vegetables, the lean meat, fish, proteins, beans and rice, um, not fried, <laughs> not soaked in butter. Um, and so helping yourself means also making the right food choices, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Healthy food habits make a significant difference when we're talking about treating high blood pressure. We want lower salt choices. Why? Salt has you retain more water. Um, more water, more hydraulic pressure, more hydraulic pressure, higher blood pressure. Um, so uh, we want to control excess body fat. We also want to help control or prevent diabetes. And it's not just eating candy or eating sugar that triggers diabetes. It's eating too much of anything. It's excess body weight. Uh, if your body is only making a certain amount of insulin, it can't drive all the blood sugar into the muscles where your body needs to use that blood sugar. Uh, if the body mass increases. And that's why we, we talk so much about people, not just about not eating the cake and pie and ice cream, but the importance of losing weight so that the insulin that someone's body is actually making is more effective. Next slide, please. So why we've already talked about these, a little bit of redundancy here, but that's how we learn. <laughs> heart disease, <clears throat> obesity increases our risk of heart disease, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, but also blood clots, uh, increased risk of blood clots, um, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, why? Because increased weight, increased pressure here, increased pressure through the neck, closes off the spaces, and when someone lays back and there's more weight on the chest, the tongue tends to fall back and block off the airway. So increased risk of sleep apnea, which also increases the risk of heart disease and strokes. <laughs> Sorry, folks, it's a little bit redundant. Um, Increased body weight also increases the risk of different types of cancer, colorectal cancer, kidney cancer, gallbladder cancer, and in women, it increases the risk of breast disease and uterine cancer. Next slide, please. So, you are what you eat, 95% <laughs> of the time. So what I tell people is, it's okay to enjoy food. <laughs> That's why we're here, we're human, we need to enjoy food. But if you eat a Big Mac or you eat badly 95% of the time, your body is going to reflect that. If you eat well 95% of the time, your body's going to reflect that. So look in your grocery cart. Don't shop when you're hungry. <laughs> okay. Um, 
if, uh, if you buy it, you'll eat it. Next slide, please. So foods have changed. Portion size has increased, and so have we. So think back to even 25 years ago, the little, the little coffee cups that we had, right? Um, so even with a little bit of cream and regular sugar, we're talking 45 calories, 8 ounces. The size of the cups that we get now, and if you go to Starbucks and get one of those, you know, venti double, I can't even say all the stuff that's in them, they're 500, 600 calories a pop in some cases. Next slide. Uh, pizza. Pizza used to be these little pieces and these, you know, thin crust, um, and we could get by with two pieces being 500 calories a pop. But now it's thick crust, big old honking pizza, and, you know, this is America. If we don't get what we think is value in our food, where you know people are going to fuss about it and take it back. We want the bigger pieces, and and it's it's taking its toll. Next slide. So my grandmother used to make these perfect little muffins, that big. They're perfect, and that's what muffins were supposed to be. But now the muffins are this big. You know they actually sell the muffin tops separately so that you could just eat just that because it's the best part. But look at the calorie difference. Significant. Next slide. I think I've only got two more of these. So popcorn. Um, you know, popcorn, same thing. We, we've supersized it. We've supersized everything. And popcorn, we tend to think of as a relatively healthy food until you make it at a fundraiser. <laughs> Have you seen how much oil and stuff they put in the popcorn when they make them at fundraisers? Um, but 270 calories for five cups, not too bad. Look at the bucket of popcorn that we buy when we go to the movies these days, the large popcorns. Mm. I uh, had the opportunity to travel with my husband to El Salvador in the 1980s. Um, he was a military advisor uh, there, and we went to a movie. And the popcorn that we got was this big. It was, it was this tiny little thing of popcorn. It probably had about 12 kernels in it. And I remember looking and saying, what's this? And that was the first phase of the Super Size Me, I think. Uh, so anyway, even, even when we're trying to eat healthy, um, and I have to be careful, but I, I love Applebee's. I do. I love going there because my daughter loves going there. We can sit, we talk, we have something. I probably like it more because I sit and talk with my daughter than I do the food. But I think, man, I'm going to get one of these salads. That's being healthy. And the other day, I actually looked at the calorie content in one of the salads that showed up. I didn't get the half size because, no, it's healthy, so I can eat the whole thing. The platter was this big. It was massive. <laughs> and... And it, had, it was actually more like 850 or 900 calories. So even when we try to eat healthy, if there's all the dressing and all the ingredients on it, because our portion size has increased, so have we. So think about the plate size and think about dividing your plate into little sections and saying, okay, I know at least half of it should be fruits and vegetables. A quarter of it should be the protein and only a quarter of it the carbohydrates. Next slide. So don't buy it. If you buy it, you're going to eat it. <laughs> Don't go to the grocery store hungry. I haven't figured out when the time for that is yet, except immediately after you eat, but don't go hungry. Ask for half portions in restaurants. Okay. Now, you, you sit down, you have a lot of meals, um, and in some cases people would be insulted if you, you know, you're not cleaning your plate or not eating all your food. But there are tricks when you're sitting talking to someone to keep yourself from finishing those last few bites that you tend to do. You say, oh, I'm full. Five minutes later, oh, a couple more bites. Oh, five minutes later, a couple more bites. So pepper half of it to the point that you couldn't eat it if you tried. <laughs> they won't know it, but I guarantee that'll dissuade you from taking those last few bites if, if you don't want it. So back to the car theme, I'm going to ask you to redistribute the load a little bit. So what are some ways to lose a couple pounds? Well, we talked about how many extra calories are in things, and we talked about some different ways to get some exercise. So what if we just make a couple minor changes that might help us get our blood pressure under control, get our diabetes under control, and help our health long term? Let's see if we can talk about a way to lose 10 pounds. Okay. So first of all, we start by decreasing our caloric intake by only about 150 calories a day. That's one can of regular Coke. That's one can of regular Dr. Pepper or regular Sprite, not the diet stuff, but just the regular stuff. It's a handful of potato chips or pretzels, just a handful, not very many. It's one cookie, 
that's about that big. Yeah, not, not the big cookie. <laughs> it's one cookie. One breakfast bar, okay? It's that, those little things that you tend to pick up. And now if we decrease those calories in, we just say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to switch to diet sodas, or I'm just not going to eat those pretzels, or I'm not going to do this. And then add in those 15 to 20 minutes of exercise once a day. That's 100 calories that you're going to burn at a minimum. That's a net change of 250 calories. Next slide, please. So 250 calories times 30 days is going to give us about 7,000 calories in one month. To lose a pound of fat takes 3,500 calories. So we do nothing more but that, two pounds a month. We do that for five months, that's 10 pounds. But you can't go back and reward yourself and say, look how good I've done and I'm going to eat those extra calories. <laughs> so, so rotate your tires. Still on the car theme, move. You have to, uh, I uh, took Taekwondo with my daughter. Um, she's a black belt. I'm a brown belt. <laughs> and she's proud of that. That's good. Um, and um, we had one of uh, a master come in from Korea and, and talk to our, uh, our group. And he was 80 years old. Um, he, in front of us, did 500 push-ups. <laughs> um, he, he, just phenomenal. And he, while he was talking to us, he stood like this for 30 minutes. Um, I can do that for about 25 seconds, and I start getting wobbly and start losing my balance. And so when he took the routine questions, we said, oh, how, did, how can you still do this? And he said, because I do it every day. I practice every day. I, you know, I practice my balance every day. Um, and when I talk to some of my elderly patients and I worry about them falling and breaking a hip or I worry about um, them not being able to get up and move around, that's, that's actually one of the examples that I use to say, I don't want you to do anything extraordinary. I don't want you to go out and start lifting weights. I don't want you to do push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups. And what I want you to do is start with something simple. I want you to start practicing your balance, meaning practice your balance. It's that simple. Start working on posture. Start working on standing up straight so that in the event that you, you feel like you're going to fall, you may have more of a chance to, to catch yourself and help yourself and prevent some of those falls and breaks. So please practice. <laughs> Rotate your tires. Get up and move. Practice balance. Um, blow out the carburetor once in a while. <laughs> That's a good thing. Exercise is wonderful. Next. So why does it help you? Because it helps to lower blood pressure. Endorphins are that body's natural feedback that the body recognizes as a morphine-like substance that gives feedback, makes us feel better, helps to decrease some depression in many, many cases, helps with fibromyalgia. It does help to control blood pressure, control cholesterol levels, helps us to reach and maintain a healthy weight, and can help to control diabetes. Next. So you've heard a lot about heart disease. Everything that I've said, I've said heart disease, heart disease, heart disease. Why heart disease? Well, heart disease is the nation's number one killer. 910,000 people in the United States every year. One every 30 seconds. There are so many contributors to that. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. Uh, one of the biggest complications of diabetes, besides kidney failure, uh, is heart disease. Um, and unfortunately, with diabetes, sometimes people um, that have diabetes do not feel the same symptoms. We, they can have what we call silent heart attacks because some of the nerve endings aren't getting the blood supply that it needs. So absolutely terrifying. Okay. Let's prevent the preventable causes. So what I'm asking you to do is take control, take charge. Um, know what your numbers are. Use common sense. Next slide. Know your risk factors. And these are the risk factors that we can change. We can control them. We may not, if we already have them, or we have a strong family history, we may not be able to prevent it 100%. But we can sure modify those risk factors and help to control some of those. We can treat high blood cholesterol. If we're smokers, please stop. If you're a smoker, please stop. And that's me begging you to help yourself. Um, if you're overweight, I am too. <laughs> then let's put some things in place to start losing some of that weight, 
to lower cholesterol, to lower blood pressure, to lower cardiovascular risks, to lower risk of diabetes. Physical inactivity, we can change that. We can be active in any way that creates, makes you work a little bit harder, makes you breathe a little bit harder. If someone's not able to walk, you can move your arms. And it doesn't take very long moving your arms to realize that you're using the big muscles in your back, shoulders. That's going to increase your blood flow. That's going to give you a cardiovascular workout as well. Control diabetes. Um, for those of you that do have diabetes, please work on getting into your doctor and doing what you can to control that, to protect yourself, to help uh, with your own health, to help prevent blindness, kidney failure, and heart disease. Next slide. So I firmly believe in moderation in all things. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I believe that we should all be driving. <laughs> life should not, and you've heard this quote many, many times, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a well-preserved uh, body, but rather, I feel like we could, should skid in sideways going, woohoo, what a ride. Um, but we want to maintain that quality of life while we're doing it. Um, and so anything that we can do at Trinity, of course, to, to help you with that, please let me know. Um, we, we want to help you with your health. So uh, Mario Andretti even says that if everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. Um, so I encourage people to drive, but not go outside the safety limits. So thank you very much. Thank you.